Europe now finds itself in the crosshairs of Vladimir Putin, who has decided to stop delivering gas. I think that it's a time where we do a wartime effort to get Canadian gas exports enabled. Here in northwestern Alberta, 2,000 meters beneath our feet, is one of the largest natural gas deposits in the world. Worth trillions of dollars, we have enough gas right here to supply Canada for decades to come, and if we so choose, much of the rest of the world. To supporters, this is an ethical and reliable source of energy on which our friends and allies can rely, while opponents demand unapologetically to leave it in the ground. So, is this the future of Canadian energy or a one-way ticket to climate destruction? Let's not let hysterics and crazy politics drive the bus. Even the Americans admit that our LNG is cleaner. The world should be following our example. This is Canada's greatest opportunity. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this is Politics Explained. It has happened. What seemed unthinkable in the 21st century is now underway. A democratic country has been invaded by its nuclear-armed neighbor. The Russian gas lines are essential. They supply 35% of gas from Russia into Europe. They've been attacked. Parts of Europe are going dark. It's just the latest fallout from the continent's ongoing energy crisis. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, the current world order was turned upside down. Funded largely by its vast resource economy, Russia's unilateral action stunned much of the rest of the world and left many wondering what would happen next. United behind Ukraine, Western democracies began applying crippling economic sanctions with, for the most part, one significant exception, Russian oil and gas. This is because Europe is entirely dependent on Russian energy particularly natural gas, which arrives via a complex network of pipelines and is less easily traded on the world market. In fact, for some countries like Italy and the United Kingdom, more than 40% of their total energy consumption, including electricity, is generated from the burning of this ubiquitous fossil fuel. But what even is natural gas? Why is it so important? And is there anything Canada can do to resupply our European allies? To begin answering these questions, I sat down with Timothy Egan, the president and CEO of the Canadian Gas Association. So uh, natural gas, if you remember from high school chemistry, it's a, it's a molecule. It's, it's a hydrocarbon molecule. It's the simplest one there is. It's CH4. So one atom of carbon, four atoms of hydrogen. Uh, it's called methane, and uh, it's found in abundance in formations underground all over the world. Uh, Canada has a pretty extraordinary abundance of it, and current estimates are that we have several hundred years of supply, so lots of it. It's used by a majority of homes in Canada for home heating, so in furnaces or water heating, or people use it for their barbecues or cooktops and so on. Natural gas is one of the world's most popular energy sources currently supplying 24.2% of all the world's energy, a number that's expected to rise even higher in the years ahead. And here in Canada, some might be surprised to know, natural gas use is even more widespread. Canada uses a lot of energy, we're a coal country, we're also a, a country with a large manufacturing and industrial sector, so we need a lot of energy, and right now natural gas meets about 38% of the energy we use in Canada and that's for industrial use, for commercial use, and for residential use. While many celebrate the widespread availability of such an inexpensive, reliable source of energy, others decidedly do not. Environmental activists, both here in Canada and around the world, have targeted an industry they say is dangerous, destructive, and an existential threat to the planet itself as concerns over fracking, land use, and CO2 emissions have led to massive protests around the globe. But are these concerns really based in reality? Or are they part of a much broader, more sinister campaign to keep Canadian resources in the ground? To find out, I decided to go right to the source and visit the natural gas capital of Canada known as the Montney, 
which straddles the region of northeastern BC and northwestern Alberta. All right, well, we're in Dawson Creek now, and uh, we are woefully unprepared. We were not expecting it to be minus 15 here in uh, Fort St. John, Dawson Creek area in the middle of April. So uh, we're gonna make a quick pit stop and uh, try to warm up our bodies before we head, uh, head outside to look at some drill pads. So we're all warmed up now. We got our toques, we got our gloves. Ready to go see some natural gas wells and cross the Alberta border. You were, I think we're here. How's it going? What's what's the best place? Should we jump in with you or follow you there? Or what do you, you think? I want to follow me there. But if you guys wanted to get closer into things, you'd have to suit up more like myself. We definitely want to get into those though, for sure. After a number of unsuccessful attempts to connect with larger multinational corporations, Calgary-based Birchcliff Energy generously offered to give us a tour of their facilities and walk us through the process of natural gas extraction. First stop was the drill site, located just across the Alberta border and in the middle of Canada's Montney Formation, one of the largest known gas deposits in the world and home to enough gas to supply all of Canada single-handedly for 145 years. We have more natural gas in Western Canada than we know what to do with. We have one of the greatest geological uh, plays and resources in the Montney, mm -hmm. and we have the ability and the wherewithal and the technical expertise to produce a lower carbon energy, transport it and sell it, and that's what we should do. The site we toured extracts natural gas using a relatively new innovation called horizontal or lateral drilling. And after a quick safety briefing, we headed out to the drill site to see exactly how this was done. The interesting thing is now we have directional abilities. Right. So when you see that, you're not just drilling straight down in the ground. You're actually drilling and they can turn that and curve that pipe under there. You wouldn't think that steel could bend the way it does underground. Very impressive. Jeff is going to tell you guys all about that. If you're thinking of a water well or an old style oil wells, we're just straight down. Uh, we can drill horizontally so it goes down and straight out. Uh, we can drill up to 20, 25 wells from here rather than 25 little pockets of, of surface leases around in the trees. Allowing multiple wells to be drilled horizontally from a single site exponentially increases the amount of accessible gas without increasing surface disturbance. This technology is commonly paired with what's known as fracking, the process by which a fluid, primarily water and sand, is injected through the pipe into the hydrocarbon deposit, fracturing the rock and allowing the natural gas to flow more freely to the surface. During our site tour, we were able to visit an active fracking operation, although to be honest, most of the action was happening beneath our feet. This is the process that has been the target of such vigorous protests for years. But unlike what activists claim, fracking is heavily regulated, not new, and presents no risk of contamination to the water table, which is located hundreds, not thousands, of meters below the surface. Remember, we've actually been fracking uh, uh, for about 80 years. Uh, we've just started fracking and combining it with lateral drilling. That's really the new innovation in the natural gas industry of the last decade or so. But fracking is not new and we do it really, really well. The technology is phenomenal. We're not just putting things down a hole and breaking rock up anywhere. We're very specifically breaking up rock in a certain area to get the most resources we can get out of that broken rock five miles underneath the ground, yeah. and it's, uh, it's incredible how we do it. What was becoming readily apparent is this was far from the Wild West free-for-all that many activists had claimed. Instead, what we found was a high-tech, professional operation where employee safety and environmental stewardship guided the extraction process. Well, we have the highest standards in the world. Uh, we are not allowed to leave a mess behind, nor do we want to. I've not drilled in 20 years and left a mess behind that uh, wasn't cleaned up. Uh, we try to leave this in as good a state as we found it when we came in. And this wasn't hyperbole. I left the active drill site to visit a former extraction site currently in the process of reclamation. 
At one time this was a, a producing lease and there was a well head here and then the uh, well obviously dried up and um, and then we were contracted to come in and remove all of the equipment, all the surface equipment and underground uh, equipment. Uh, the ground's still a little rough. Is this the final condition of what this is going to look like? No, it's not. There's still another phase right now that has to go through the uh, REM rec stage. So in, in five, ten years from now, will this kind of be indistinguishable from the landscape around it? Absolutely will, yeah. yeah. It'll blend right in. Okay. This level of environmental reclamation is fairly unique to Canada and is but a part of a broader set of strict environmental standards that, to put it mildly, are not followed by many of the other natural gas producers in the world. So, with massive reserves, a huge economic opportunity, and environmental standards that are second to none, is it finally time to get Canadian gas overseas, particularly to Canada's European allies, whose gas supplies have now largely been cut off by Russia, and who are facing severe shortages, spiraling prices, and serious concerns about how they'll make it through the winter. In the short term, we have an active war in Europe. Our allies are under attack and are increasingly vulnerable to energy scarcity because Russia could turn off the taps at any point. Natural gas buyers are concerned that they're just buying their fuel from Russia mm -hmm. or from Qatar mm -hmm. uh, and the US. So if you're a buyer of energy and you only have three sellers, you get a little nervous that if someone cuts you off, like Russia, where are you going to get your energy from? The geopolitics of energy have changed dramatically in the last three months with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia, one of the world's largest uh, producers uh, and exporters of natural gas, supplying one of the world's biggest markets, the European market. The European market is suddenly saying, we're not sure we want to be dependent on this gas on a go-forward basis. Well, here's an opportunity for countries like Canada and the United States, free, functioning democracies with the rule of law um, and solid regulatory process to say, you know what, we should be stepping up our game and we should be the supplier of choice. We should be the reliable energy provider to places like Europe. There's no doubt in light of this, this terrible war that's going on, that Russian gas is looking to be uh, replaced, mm -hmm. and we have it. And so there's a, just a, a waiting uh, industry for us. The, these buyers, all they're looking for is security of supply. Mm -hmm. They don't care about price. They're looking for security of supply so that they know that their countries can, will have energy with which to grow. European leaders are desperately trying to find new sources of natural gas to replace their Russian supply. In August, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz visited Canada to see if he could secure a new source of what's called LNG, or liquefied natural gas, which is the process by which gas is cooled, liquefied, and exported across the world's oceans. But instead of receiving support from his Canadian ally, all Scholz got was a collective shrug with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau even going so far as to suggest the quote, business case for such an undertaking didn't exist. This despite the fact the federal government itself killed a $14 billion LNG export facility proposed in Quebec weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine. Along with a long line of other anti-energy policies such as the anti-pipeline bill C-69, that seem designed to keep Canadian resources in the ground, all in the name, of course, of fighting climate change. But does artificially restricting natural gas exports from Canada really help the environment? You know, when you see pictures of cities in the developing world with really poor air quality, overwhelmingly it's because they will be burning dung or wood or coal, more polluting hydrocarbons, uh, that have a very negative effect on air quality. Uh, the biggest reduction we've seen in Canada of greenhouse gas emissions is when we shut down our coal-fired power plants and replaced it with gas. Same in the United States. Natural gas is a much cleaner, lower emitting source of energy than what most countries currently use, specifically coal. This is reflected in the fact that even though Donald Trump pulled the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement and the carbon emission targets they imposed, the US still reduced their emissions faster than Canada, 
simply by switching many of their coal-fired plants over to natural gas, a process which is now underway in this country as well. Okay, so uh, we're just on our way to Grand Cache, Alberta, just south of Grand Prairie to check out a new power plant, or it's not exactly new, it used to be a coal power plant, and they're about to shut it down as Alberta transitioned away from coal-fired uh, electricity, and instead they've been able to turn it into a natural gas combined cycle plant. And these are really interesting because they provide power efficiently, economically, cheaply, reliably, and they also do so by dramatically uh, reducing uh, CO2 emissions and basically completely eliminating particulate pollution, which is what uh, constitutes air pollution. So we're gonna go check it out. We're gonna go see how that uh, transition is going. And uh, we're really excited to see what this is all about. From a traditional particulate pollution, which is obviously still a huge issue in lots of parts of the world, how much particulate pollution, so pollution that affects the air, air quality that you breathe, does this, will the new natural gas plant produce? Virtually none. Virtually and none. As far as particulate. And then if we start looking at the carbon intensity, the carbon intensity is lower as well. Yeah. So if you just, you know, just take a look at the basic, the basic molecules, the natural gas molecules are, you know, you've got, you've got a carbon and four hydrogens in its, in its purest form, the methane instead of the, the long chain carbon molecules you find in the coal. So when, when you combust it, you're, you're generating just a fraction of the carbon dioxide. The Milner power plant was originally converted from burning coal to what's called simple cycle natural gas. This is the most common type of gas power plant, but not the most efficient. However, the plant is now in the process of being upgraded again to what's called combined cycle natural gas, where the waste heat is routed to an additional steam turbine, which can produce up to 50% more electricity from the same amount of fuel and, importantly, the same amount of carbon emissions. A coal-fired plant will produce 1,000 grams of CO2 for every kilowatt hour that it produces. A simple cycle plant will produce about half that, so 500 grams. And a state-of-the-art combined cycle plant, which we're not far from, um, would produce about 360. Natural gas-fired combined cycle plant can give you 99% capacity 365 days a year. Wind turbines can never do that. It doesn't matter where you put them. Solar panels can't do that. It doesn't matter where you put them. To put this all in perspective, in 2019, coal-fired power generation comprised 36%, more than one-third, of all electricity production in the world. If coal could be replaced quickly and efficiently with natural gas, specifically Canadian natural gas, global emissions could be significantly reduced. CO2 is a global problem. It's not just that. It's yeah. everyone's. Um, well, I always say it doesn't. If, if you make a decision that slightly lowers your emissions, but it increases emissions elsewhere in the world, you haven't really accomplished that much. Exactly. I have a fundamental problem with our strategy in Canada in terms of how it affects the absolute emissions worldwide mm -hmm. by shutting down our resources mm -hmm. that are much more efficient, uh, exporting that to Malaysia, mm -hmm. Japan, China, to help them reduce they're less efficient generation. Today in India and China, they're building new coal-fired power plants. We need to be able to get our gas to those markets. And I think the, the big change is what's happening in Europe. They're using more coal again. They're importing that coal from Russia and they're, they're asking Canada to be a supplier of gas for them so they can get off it. We produce um, uh, one of the cleanest gas molecules in the world, uh, by which I mean, uh, the actual CO2 uh, emission level when we're producing our gas is much lower than many other global producers. So this, and this isn't even natural gas versus, uh, you know, other forms of energy like coal. This is our natural gas versus other Correct. countries' natural gas. Correct. Shining a spotlight on Europe right now, they're importing 40, 50 percent of their gas from Russia. Russia has no regulations on emissions, on methane, on leak detection. It is a very high CO2 natural gas. I believe we have an obligation to take our 
responsibly produce energy and sell it to these other countries, one, so that they can reduce their uh, carbon footprint, but two, the world is starved of energy. There's people who have no electricity and they have no access to water, so we're just walking away from those obligations. Mm -hmm. Despite the apparent environmental and economic benefits of Canadian natural gas and the desperation of our European allies, attempts to export it overseas have failed dramatically. Since 2011, of the 18 proposed LNG export facilities in Canada, 17 have been cancelled, blocked or outright abandoned. The result of hostile government policies and an incessant activist campaign to keep Canadian resources in the ground. Only one, LNG Canada's $40 billion undertaking is now under construction and only after significant delays. It's located on Canada's west coast in Kitimat, BC, which is where I was headed next. So we're here in Kitimat. We, uh we're looking around and we've, we've been able to get the drone up in the sky and it's just absolutely incredible the scale and scope it is the largest construction project in the history of Canada and um, it's just a great story that employs people really from the pipeline to getting the natural gas out of the ground in Fort St. John and maybe more importantly it is actually uh, also a positive for the environment supplying clean reliable and ethical natural gas around the world specifically to markets in Asia that displace coal. But even a project as large and significant as LNG Canada is not out of the woods yet. A relentless, organized crusade waged by environmental groups continues to threaten to bring the project grinding to a halt, as their tactics from peaceful protests to illegal blockades and even violent attacks have strategically targeted the coastal gaslink pipeline the main artery that is needed to supply the LNG facility with Canadian natural gas. Their goal being to either pressure governments to pull their support for the project or to raise the costs on the private company trying to complete it to the point where they are forced to abandon their efforts altogether. These environmental groups have also succeeded in co-opting a wide range of Hollywood celebrities to support their cause including Leonardo DiCaprio and Mark Ruffalo, both of whom have weaponized their large international platforms to denounce the project and call for its cancellation. Despite never visiting the region or speaking to the elected First Nation leaders like Alice Ross, who helped spearhead the project in the first place. How does that make you feel when you see these kind of big wigs down in Los Angeles and other places saying these kinds of things? The, number one, they have no idea uh, about the First Nations up here in terms of the amount of uh, effort that we put into bringing LNG to BC. It was First Nations that brought LNG to BC. It wasn't the provincial government. It wasn't the federal government. From 2004 to 2011, it was First Nations from Prince George to Kitimat that told BC, you've got to get behind LNG as an export to Asia. Number two, these Hollywood stars have no interest and don't care about First Nations in BC or Canada living in poverty. And number three, it just basically astounds me that people actually believe that Hollywood movie stars have any moral fiber and that we should be looking at Hollywood to actually guide our lives or guide our future in terms of building a province. It's, it's true. astounding. It's, it's that weird kind of celebrity worship. Like, why would why would somebody who who played a cast of characters in a Marvel movie be the one we're looking to for moral and economic guidance? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I've invited Leonardo DiCaprio to come up here and talk about Aboriginal issues, talk about Aboriginal leadership, talk about who brought LNG to BC, meaning the First Nations. I, I've said the same thing to Mark Ruffalo and all those other celebrities, but they refuse to look at any facts. But is a refusal to listen to the facts the full story? Could there possibly be deeper, more nefarious intentions behind this coordinated assault on Canadian LNG? And why haven't these American environmental groups and their Hollywood supporters targeted the massive increase in American gas exports happening at the exact same time in their own backyard? They are certainly benefiting the economic outcomes of the United States by limiting Canada's ability to have our own sovereignty over our resources and our exports. The U.S. Are, have been able to 
uh, almost be the exclusive consumer of Canadian gas. When we do export our gas, it goes through a U.S. facility that gets the benefit of, uh, of being our broker. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe coincidence. A lot of the uh, people who are picking on us are financed by U.S. energy. Because mm -hmm. the less energy we produce, the better it is for them. Yeah. The Shell LNG project, they started back in 2007 or 8. Mm -hmm. So it's taken them 14 years to get their project yeah. built. In that time, the last five years, the U.S. has built out their LNG. Mm -hmm. So their exports, which is about 20 BCF a day, yeah. is 25% more than what we're producing than in total. total. Production. So like, you know, hello Canada. Are, anybody awake out there? You guys just all freezing up there. Like we are so slow, so over-regulated that we're letting a bigger country run all over us. It's, it's, that's the biggest frustration. At the same time that Canada has struggled to build a single LNG export facility, the United States has built seven and approved 20 more. Landlocking Canadian gas at a time of surge in global demand, and despite Canada being the fourth largest natural gas producer in the entire world. We could be getting that gas to the world, mm -hmm. and uh, that's energy that could be offsetting higher emitting energy in other parts of the world, that could be contributing to eliminating uh, poverty in other parts of the world, improving air quality, and generating significant revenue for Canada. The people that oppose LNG, uh, they like to think of it as BC warming or Canada warming. They don't like to use the word global warming. Like everything has a wall at the borders of Canada yeah. and emissions <laughs> just affects Canada, that's it. Yeah. I mean, the, they don't believe that emissions from Asia, India, or United States affects us. I mean, somehow we're siloed off. And they don't seem to think that if Shell doesn't build it here, they'll go build another one and. Qatar or the United States or yeah. Australia or, or any of these other countries, some of which are not so, so nice, obviously. Given the energy conversation that's happening in Europe, given the energy conversation, the emissions conversation that's happening in India and China, this is absolutely embarrassing. We have high environmental standards, we have high labor standards, we have high social standards. I don't understand why Canadians keep allowing themselves to get kicked in the knees every time we turn around and talk about energy. If anything else, the world should be following our example. It's just so, it's just, I just look at the issue and it's create tons of jobs in Canada, lift First Nations out of poverty, reduce global emissions, uh, reduce particulate pollution all over the world. It's such a no-brainer. Like it's almost, it's almost uh, the most obvious uh, development project of all time and we're still, uh, we seem to be doing everything we can to prevent it from being successful. After more than a week on the road, thousands of kilometers and countless conversations, one thing became abundantly clear. Canada has a generational opportunity. One that could generate trillions of dollars in wealth while lowering global emissions and positioning our country as the energy supplier of choice for much of the rest of the world. It's also an opportunity that as of now is passing us by the result of an aligned set of politicians and environmental groups that are ideologically determined, regardless of context, to keep Canadian resources in the ground, irrespective of the consequences to First Nations, the global environment, or maybe most importantly, our allies overseas. Our allies around the world need us to step up. The environment needs Canada's natural gas to step up and start displacing coal. And once we start looking at it as both an opportunity and an obligation, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that we're going to take our rightful place as a global supplier of choice. It's a clean energy source, it's incredibly affordable, it's the most reliable, and as you've noted, the export opportunity is a huge one. We could be helping the world. We could be doing so much more, but the politics and the rhetoric keep us back. Reconciliation to me means basically getting First Nations away from poverty, getting them away from prisons, getting their kids away from uh, going into government care. The rest of it is political garbage. The reconciliation has no meaning when the politicians talk about it. I mean, we went from being one of the poorest First Nations in BC to one of the most wealthiest. And it's one of the first steps that I wanted to take to get away from the Indian Act. And we took that first step. And we're not looking back. It's, it's just such a great story.
My name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained.